Okay, um, well, thanks, Grant, for doing the introduction for me. Um, he's just flown, flown back from Germany, so he's really appreciate that he's spent the time to come here and, and do that for me. And thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this seminar today, and I really appreciate your presence. And I'm very passionate about sharing my research with you. So um, the title, as Grant said, just how much? Um, um, I think the, uh, the answer really depends. And in this talk, uh, I want to go through the, the models that we've built and the knowledge that we've gained to help us arrive at, uh, at this answer. So, uh, and also, I'd like to talk about what, what, does, uh, what sort of things does this, this lead us to. So, just starting with a very, the very broad picture stuff, uh, why we're here, because um, there's, a, there's a important, food is really important for us. There's, we need to make sure there's adequate food supply. And looking at um, the past um, yield increase o over the past 50 or 60 years or so, uh, we can see there's a linear, there's a steady, sta steady trend of increase, which helped the world uh, to, to uh, supply the, uh, the population to sustain the populations that we have at the moment. But looking into the future, um, uh, we have identified a few things that, that's going to uh, challenge um, the, the global food, food supply. First thing is that uh, in the near future, we'll be seeing a population increase. So people have est estimated around 2050, there's going to be around nine, nine or 10 billion people. And in, at the same time, we also have diet shift. So people shifting to eating more meat product, which requires more uh, uh, staple food to produce. We also see an uh, increase in biofuel consumption, and there are also climate challenges. Um, the, all of these factors challenging us, uh, the, challenging the food production, global food, food production. So all of them amounts to uh, something like this. If we, what this graph is trying to say is, is if we keep on our current yield increase trend, we are likely not be, uh, not be able to meet the, uh, the future food, food demand. Um, so what are we gonna do? Um, to, look, to look at crop yield in a very simplistic term here, just for a start, uh, it's, there are a few factors that gives us crop yield. So we have land, uh, resource capture, so how much resources your crop plants can capture, sunlight, water, um, CO2, and resource conversion, so how much of this energy or these resources gets converted to crop biomass. And then the last bit is harvesting index, so how much um, biomass gets converted to harvestable product, for example, grains. And looking, in looking in the past, uh, we've, uh, we've came to the conclusion that resource capture, so how much uh, energy is get, resource gets captured, has um, likely reached its, its maximum. So there's probably not much more room to increase this bit uh, to increase crop yield. And the same is with harvesting index. So this, this ratio has, has um, likely reached its biological maximum. And it is obviously difficult to significantly increase uh, agri uh, agricultural land uh, to increase yield. But what people have found is that uh, resource conversion has pretty much uh, stayed at the very bottom, bottom um, uh, scale uh, uh, on, this, um, on this whole equation. So this is why um, there's now a uh, there's now significant uh, research uh, activities around trying to increase resource conversion efficiencies of of our crop plants. So, what underpins resource conversion? Um, it is underpinned by photosynthesis and its related uh, processes. And what photosynthesis does is it converts sunlight, CO2, water into carbohydrate and oxygen. And there are a few lines of evidence that suggest increasing photosynthesis 
can help us improve crop yield. And one of them is that when people have compared breeding materials from the 60s to the 80s or 90s in wheat, that they found there is a nice correlation between photosynthetic efficiency and, and wheat yield. The second line of evidence is when people compare C3 and C4 crops, uh, we found that C4 crops, which does more photosynthesis, has higher yield, uh, have higher yields as well. And so people thought, okay, maybe we can try to increase the photosynthetic rates in C3 plants. And people did this in um, experiments where they've elevated the uh, MBM CO2. So they put crops in this uh, elevated CO2 rings. And they found that if you put C3 crops in these, these elevated CO2 rings, um, they can increase the, the yield of, of, of soybeans, for example. So there are a few, there's a couple of strong evidence that suggests if we increase photosynthesis, there may be some hope of increasing crop yield. So just a, some details on photos, what photosynthesis does at a biochemical or, or leaf level. So if you can imagine, this is a cross section of a leaf. You have the leaf epidermis, you have stomata. Uh, CO2 goes in and out, and water comes out uh, through this stomata pore. And what the CO2 does is, in C3, it, uh, it diffuses through your intercellular space, goes into chloroplast, and get fixed by this important enzyme, Rubisco. And, and that drives your Kelvin cycle, which gives you carbohydrate. Now, there are three uh, important steps in, in this whole picture. The first one is, as I said, the, uh, the conversion of CO2 into carbohydrate through Rubisco and, and Kelvin cycle. The other important step is the light reactions, which is uh, when light photons get converted into um, chemical energies that drives, help drives the, uh, the photosynthetic machineries. And also we have the CO2 supply to the Rubisco, which is also important. And that is determined by uh, the, the uh, conductance, by fusional conductance uh, through this stomata pore and through this intercellular airspace and, and to the carboxylation side of Rubisco. So three main pieces that uh, determines how, how much uh, photosynthesis you can get. And so people knew, knew, so people have studied this and then, and then sort of trying to come up with the estimates of how much we get by tweaking those different bits. And this uh, review paper by Long uh, et al. from Illinois, University of Illinois, they've uh, came up with this uh, esti estimations. So if we, for example, optimize the regulation of RUVP, RUVP which is the conversion from photons to chemical energy, uh, they're estimating there's potentially 60% increase in the conversion efficiency uh, of your crop. And there are also many other targets that <coughs> they've, they've also looked at. So, um, how, how did these um, estimates came about? And, and the question is, uh, we want to ask if these estimates are reliable in terms of your whole cropping uh, situations. Well, we can look into what sort of models that people have been doing, playing with, to come up with those estimates. And this is an example of a leaf level modeling where they've uh, modeled the metabolic, metabolic Metabol metabolic pathways of photosynthesis. So going from uh, CO2 in the air uh, through a lot of uh, in inter intermediate steps all the way to your Rubisco and uh, Kelvin cycle uh, for, for carbohydrate production. And they've used this metabolic model and they've estimated that if we, if we can uh, put a shell around this important rubisco enzyme, which then, if we can pump CO2 into this shell uh, to, to make it saturated with CO2, um, they, they, they've estimated that we can increase photosynthesis by 60, 60%. Uh, 
And then they go on to say, if we have a photosynthesis increase by 60%, we can get 36 to 60% increase in yield. Um, but I think this is a big jump, big leap from, from this leaf level estimation to, to yield. Now the second example is where people have done canopy modeling. So they've um, coupled this very complex photosynthesis model with a canopy architectural model. And they also use light tracing so they can model each, every different photons in, in this uh, canopy structure, how they bounced around, how they get absorbed and all that. And they claim that they can, they can calculate or they can estimate how much photosynthesis uh, your canopy would do over a time scale over a day. But the thing here is that it is just a day, it is a daily uh, calculation and to scale that to the, your, your crop yield, there's still a big gap in, in there. And there's also, so the next example is where people have done some crop modeling, where they've attached photosynthesis models, uh, or they've incorporated photosynthesis model into crop modeling. And this example is um, by, uh, by Ian and Strick uh, from the Netherlands, uh, from the Wageningen University. Uh, they've used GCROS, GCROS rice crop models, and they've estimated that if we, so these are the different routes that you can change photosynthesis. Um, they've estimated that if we do number nine, which is uh, concentrating, having the shell concentrating the CO2 around Rubisco, uh, we can get about 70% increase in, in yield. So they've, in biomass, so they've, they've simulated from photosynthesis to crop biomass in the field. Um, but the, uh, the thing here is that we are not sure how reliable their uh, predictions is on the water limitation because um, if you enhance the, uh, the, gro the growth of a crop under water limited conditions, um, usually you would expect there's a, there's a penalty because you might be using up uh, a lot of your stored uh, soil water. So, um, and also um, this, this, uh, this estimated increase does seems a bit far-fetched because it, it, it's suggesting that if we do this, it, we can solve the, uh, the, the global food problem. So, <laughs> so I think, um, and, and, and the last example is uh, where people are trying to put uh, different models together. Uh, here you have photosynthesis, here you have plant growth, you have root growth, and they, uh, this group of people from the University of Illinois, they've tried to come up with this framework that can, that they're trying to attempt, trying to simulate uh, your crop growth uh, from first principles, so from, from your gene expressions and all that. And they've also used high performance computing to try to give people a good visual of what's going on there. So, so based on these models that people have um, developed and, try and applied um, to give us an understanding of how much we can get from changing photosynthesis, um, the other line of research is that people actually, uh, where people actually uh, produce these transgenics um, and grow these crops, uh, grow these plants to see what's the effect of changing photosynthesis. And in this example is um, where they have um, altered the photorespiration pathway. So the, the other thing I forgot to mention in photosynthesis is that Rubisco, while reacting with CO2, it can also react with oxygen, um, which, which uh, it will generate some unwanted byproduct. And to recycle these unwanted byproducts, the plants need to spend energy, and it also loses carbon dioxide in the process. So what these people have done in their transgenics is that um, they are trying, they've tried to reduce this uh, unwanted side effect in photosynthesis. And they've claimed that when, if, if, if they do that, uh, photosynthesis can increase. Uh, photosynthesis can increase from for about uh, from 20 to about 25. Uh, 
And when they grow these plants in the field, they saw a 40% increase in crop biomass. So this is tobacco, by the way. Um, but I think there, we think there are, there are a few issues here um, about this 40% increase in biomass. And we'll, we'll come back to that. The other example is uh, where people have tried to increase rubisco content in, in your leaves. So as I said, rubisco is, a, is the, uh, the main enzyme that fixes CO2. And when they, when they, when they did this in maize, they saw uh, some increase in photosynthesis, photosynthetic rates. So that's photosynthetic rates over uh, intercellular air CO2, this uh, response plot. They saw some increase in photosynthetic rates. And they also seen some inc increase in, crop, in plant biomass and also um, plant height. So it appears that, uh, it appears that there's, there does seem to have some effect in, in plant performance when you, when you change photosynthesis. But the, uh, the question is, well, if we put this, in, this plant in, in, in the field, what, like, are we still going to see this increase in performance or no? So that's the question um, that we are still trying to get to, or, or these people are still trying to get to. And there's another example where people have um, increased um, the uh, electron transport efficiency, so the conversion of photons to chemical energies, uh, which drives photosynthesis. And what they've done here is when they reduce this efficiency, um, they saw an, a decrease in photosynthesis. So the, 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 these are the solar shapes are wild types, and then these are transgenic uh, or mutants. And when they plot plant dry weight or biomass, they also seen a correlation between, um, so they've seen a correlation between photosynthetic rates and plant biomass. They've also seen correlation between grain yield or grain weight uh, and um, photosynthetic rates. And what they propose is that instead of going this way, if we go the other way, um, there's, there's some potential that we can increase biomass and yield. But all of these are good. So the modeling, the, the, the transgenic plants, they've shown some evidence that we can manipulate photosynthesis and there are some impact on, on, on crop performance. But um, the, the question here is that the other, uh, the other side of the, of, the, of the argument is that when, when people have looked into uh, increasing photosynthesis and, and the final crop performance, we, we think uh, people found that there's, um, if we scale from biochemistry to leaf to canopy to crop, as, you, as we scale up, uh, your effect tends to diminish uh, across the levels. And the other thing is there's also feed, feedbacks from crop growth and development plus environmental effects that would influence um, how your crop performs in the field. So, so I think the, uh, the over-simplistic simpl view of the few factors giving us yield is not an appropriate um, model to use here. Uh, instead, there's a more comprehensive model that we should be using to really understand how these um, mechanisms interact with the environment, with genetics, with crop management practices to really give us a more reliable estimate of, uh, of crop yield. And in this framework uh, by Hammer, uh, Graham, Graham Hammer here at El, uh, we've modeled water and light interactions that gives us the, uh, um, the final crop performance. And so taking all of those modeling um, the prior work that we, we came out with this sort of framework um, to enhance to enha to enhance this, um, this this modeling framework. So we have um, models at the crop level, we have models at the canopy level, and models at the at the uh, at the leaf level. And there are evidence. So there are evidence that people are trying to scale up the leaf level models to the canopy level, 
And there are also work done to, to, re, to connect your crop level models to your canopy level models. So the, this, the, emerging, the emerging picture here is that we can use the three scales of modeling um, to try to pre, uh, develop a, a modeling framework that can help us understand um, how much, uh, what do we get at this level if we change um, photosynthesis. So over several iterations, we've come up with, uh, with this um, framework. It, will, it has the three levels of modeling, uh, scales, three, three levels of scales, and we also have interactions between these scales, uh, which are vital um, to really scale up your, our effect at this level to the crop level. And these, these, um, these factors include your canopy leaf area index, so how much leaves per unit of ground, and your canopy, your leaf, uh, leaf nitrogen content. Uh, all of these drives your photosynthesis model and your photosynthesis model gives us CO2 assimilation, which we can use that to calculate your canopy uh, growth. And we can feed that into your crop models to, which then calculates how, it, uh, how crop growth over, over a season. So, so just going into this uh, photosynthesis model a bit more. Um, so we've, uh, so to build this model, we need to know, we, we need to build this framework, we need to know which sort of models we need to use uh, at the different scales. And to start with photosynthesis is, um, so there are, there, there's quite a few photosynthesis models around. And so these models, uh, they've, been, they've been developed using the photosynthetic light response. So we have photosynthesis rate, and then it responses to, responds to light. And the difference here is that it, there's just increasing complications, increasing sophistications of modeling this, uh, this response. The other, um, the other type of photosynthesis model is um, the biochemical models of photosynthesis, which has been developed by Graham Farquhar, Susanna von Cameron, and Barry uh, in the 1980s. And this model is one of the uh, most successful photosynthesis models in, in, in the literature at the moment because it can, it can uh, very well simulate the photosynthesis response to um, CO2 concentration. And we can routinely uh, obtain this sort of response using the, uh, the, the gas exchange system, like for, for example, like uh, 6400. And in the model, they've assumed that, or it is modeled that photosynthesis is the minimum of either the rubisco activity, so the important enzyme rubisco, or the electron transport limitations, so the conversion from photon to chemical energies. And the minimum of those two rates gives us the photosynthetic response to CO2 concentration. So we've, uh, this is the sort of um, the model that we're aiming to, to incorporate into our bigger framework because first, it models the important steps in photosynthesis, and second, uh, we have, uh, we have um, readily available machines that can help us generate this, this curve. So it's, it helps model parameterization. And to the canopy scale, again, there's several different ways you can model your crop canopy, uh, ranging from the simple light interception models. So the amount of incoming radiation, you can do some calculation to get calculations to get what, what's the percentage of uh, interception. And you can also go to a very complex architectural model where you simulate every different photons in your canopy and how, they are, how much they are observed by different parts of the leaves or stem or whatever. But, or, or you can have something in between, um, which is um, assuming that we can divide canopy leaf area into either sunlit, sunlit or shaded. And 
and we've, um, we've uh, finalized on using this type of model because it helps us to build our overall uh, cross-scale modeling framework. Um, this, this canopy model um, responds to leaf area index, which is an output from the crop model. It also responds to uh, leaf, um, leaf, leaf nitrogen, which is also, again, another output from the crop, crop model. So using this type of canopy model, we, um, it helps us to facilitate the connection between the different scales of modeling. And just a bit of detour, uh, we've um, developed our, this sort of canopy model with photosynthetic models, uh, and then we put it up on, on our website. So you can go to this website to have a play with the model that here we just, we can specify the, uh, the environment uh, the, or, and then and, and parameters for your, for your crop. What this model does is it can generate your daily canopy photosynthesis over a day. And then we can, you can switch between C3 and C4 crops. So it's, it's a very nice model to play with uh, to try to understand uh, well, this part of the, the, of the whole picture. So, okay, so we have this model developed. We, uh, the next thing is we want to make sure that it is, it is sensible, it does um, sensible things. And we can look at, we, can, we need to examine the different levels uh, of, of the modeling. So at the uh, leaf level, um, the biochemical levels of photosynthesis uh, captures our photosynthetic rates response responding to, uh, to a CO2 concentration. So which looks good. And moving on to the canopy scale, um, we can simulate canopy photosynthesis over a day. This is a C3 wheat crop. Um, uh, and then that's on the water limit, non-limiting conditions. On the water limited conditions, as expected, your canopy photosynthesis uh, profile drops, reduces. And for C4 crop, we can also do the canopy profile. And if you compare, you can see the C4, the C4 species, uh, the C4 simulation has a higher photosynthetic rate as expected. And when you compare transpiration, the amount of water loss, you can see the C4 simulation shows uh, less transpiration. So it is also in line with expectation so C4 has higher photosynthetic rates, but lower uh, water use. So we can reproduce those effects uh, at this canopy level. And moving on to the whole crop level, um, we can simulate, the, the whole cross-scale model simulates your leaf area index over time. So this is sowing, that's harvesting. So leaf area index, we can simulate a profile. We can also simulate a profile of leaf nitrogen content or specific leaf nitrogen. And all of that um, helped us produce this daily canopy photos, daily biomass growth over time. And we can also simulate the differences, uh, the usage of, of soil water as your crop grow. So in the end, we can get this um, simulation of the biomass over the season. And you, we need to, you need to know that um, there's a lot of response that we need to get right um, to really simulate this uh, mechanistically and correctly. So to put that to the, uh, to the real test, uh, at, so f some field data, field experiment data, uh, there's for this one, so panel A for wheat, uh, there's 100, 107 experiments. So 107 um, uh, ex full season experiments. So we have every point here is a simulation of about four months or five months. Um, so every point is a, so on the X axis, we have the observed biomass in the field. On the Y axis, we have the predicted biomass and as you can see, there's a very tight one-to-one -one correlation between, uh, between prediction and observation. And we can also look at the C4 uh, prediction and observation. 
it lies very closely to the one-to-one -one ratio. And the two bottom graphs shows if we compare our cross-scale model, which has the photosynthesis and the canopy and the, and the crop, comparing that to the standard, just the crop model alone, um, there's no decrease, or there's no obvious decrease in prediction power. So this is really saying, um, by introducing a lot, of, a lot of details into your crop models, uh, we haven't messed up anything yet, so which is good to, good to know. And I can show you the same prediction versus observed for grain yield, predict, uh, grain yield simulations. Again, all of them align very nicely to the one-to-one -one ratio. So these things, are, uh, so these, these um, val validations is suggesting the uh, cross-scale model framework does, um, does a pretty good job at simulating crop yield and, and biomass. So now we're moving on to um, using the model to do some simulations um, to look at just how much uh, we, do we get from changing manipulating photosynthesis. And as I talked about before, we have the three main, step, uh, three main uh, pathways here. Uh, for the light re reactions, I'll call it JMAX, so the conversion from photon to chemical energy, I'll call it JMAX. And the rate at which Rubisco, uh, the rate at which Rubisco react with oxygen, uh, with CO2, I'll call it VC max. And the diffusion, the diffusional uh, constant uh, inside the leaves, I'll just call it GM. So let's look at what happens if we tweak these three um, factors in photosynthesis. And so the simulation I've, we've done is We've taken 100 years of historical weather data uh, from Dolby, and we are simulating a standard wheat and sorghum crop. So on the left, we have wheat crop. On the right, we have sorghum. So we are simulating standard sorghum and wheat over 100 years of um, variable environment, uh, variable weather environment. And we've uh, characterized the environment into different um, levels of water uh, availability. So in the first category, we have um, environment where we've applied um, unlimited irrigation, so there's no water limitation. And then we have rain-fed um, environment. Uh, here, these are the seasons where uh, your final, our final, similar final crop yield is above the average, and then we have uh, these seasons here where the crop yield is below the average. So what we can see here is um, as we apply different photosynthesis manipulations uh, to these crops, um, we can see the, uh, it's resp the yield response. So this is percentage change in yield. So this is 7.2%, for example. We can see percentage change in yield increases as we as we start to stack the different uh, parts of the photosynthesis enhancements together. And for wheat, we can see if we stack the three uh, factors, uh, the, the three manipulations together, it, produces, it produced the, uh, the most effect. So there's about 20, 12%, 10% increase in, in yield. But as we go down this scale to, uh, to water limitation, water limited environment, we can see these, uh, these uh, yield increase so drops due to water limitation. And for wheat, uh, for sorghum, uh, if we go to the, uh, to the water limited environment, there's actually a negative impact on simulated yield. So there's a lot of information in, uh, in this table, but the overall message is that if we tweak photosynthesis, there's definitely, there, there's some, there, there's definitely impact on yield, but the, the, the degree, that, the extent that it changes depends, depends on the type of manipulations you apply, and it also depends on the type of environment you are growing, you grow your crops in, and also the differences in species as well. And I just want to go through, go into this 
to show you why we are simulating a um, negative increase in, in yield. So let's focus on the pink uh, curves first. So under water limited environment, without irrigation here I've noted, um, as, we, if you, if, as we, if you follow the, uh, the pink line, the pink curve, um, it is outperforming the baseline simulation, so without manipulation. It outperforms the baseline uh, in, the, in the early part of the season. But as we go towards the end of this, towards the end of the season, where stored soil water uh, reduces or diminishes, you can see at at point at times this pink curve uh, under underperforms compared to the baseline, and it is under so under these terminal drought stress conditions, uh, we see a a, a penalty at, of uh, crop growth. And that's, that's, lead, that's the reason leading to the uh, reduced um, yield um, under these water stressed environment. The other thing, what, the other thing we've identified from, from this is um, there's, also, there's also suggested that if we increase photosynthesis while keeping transpiration, crop water demand transpiration the same, so we don't allow transpiration to go up with photosynthesis. What happens is that um, it, the manipulated or the, the simulation, this enjoyed the increase in photosynthesis, increase in growth in the early part of the season. And for the, late part, for the later part of the season, um, the penalty on crop growth it, um, was not there because um, keeping transpiration um, in check uh, helped us retain a bit more of the soil moisture, which helped us, uh, which helped with the yield uh, at the end of the season. So that's the, that's the blue line here. And that explains why under water limited conditions, increasing photosynthesis will give us yield penalty, but if we keep our transpiration in check, uh, we can revert um, this penalty. And I think I'll skip that. So, so okay, so in summary, um, I think I've shown you that we've, we've developed a capability to assess um, what happens when we change photosynthesis. And the question coming back to, our, to my title, just how much do we get from changing photosynthesis? Well, I've shown you in the table, it depends. It depends on your environment, it depends on what you are changing, and it depends on uh, what crop you're working with. And crop modeling has helped us understand how these changes, or how, how your crop will respond uh, to these changes. Uh, I've shown you through the table a lot of what if uh, simulations that uh, we can combine that we can stack the different photosynthetic manipulation routes to give us the greatest yield. And we've also identified that if we, if we uh, unlink photosynthesis to transpiration, stomatal conductance, uh, we can mitigate the negative impact under those water limited conditions. So few uh, future directions from this. Uh, what we're gonna do next is to use the modeling framework and to, to apply the modeling framework to assess the other, lots of other manipulation roads that's currently being researched. So we want to, we want to provide a understanding of, um, of, the, of the yield impact of all the, all the photosynthetic manipulation routes. Um, this will have to be done with with the ad, more advances in cross scale in this framework. And the next bit is we want to scale this to, to a broader scale simulation. So what I've shown in the table was just at a single site. We want to understand what happens at different multiple environments and, and different climates as well. And hopefully by using the model, by using the modeling uh, tools, 
that we can start to understand how, what do we need to do to, um, to really optimize our crop, uh, our crop improvement on the different environments um, to help mitigate the, uh, the impending food crisis around the, around the world. So here I'd like to conclude and thank uh, our collaborators. So especially Professor Graham Hammer, he's uh, provided a lot of mentoring and an expert uh, into building, helping me to build this framework. And a lot of um, top experts in, at the univers uh, Australian National Univers Universities where these are the experts that knows, knows about photosynthesis. So we've been collaborating with these people a lot. Um, and <coughs> so that's the end of my talk, thanks.